Well, good morning, everyone. If you're a guest, we're so glad you've joined us. Welcome to this worship service rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, last week we announced that beginning October 4th, Sunday, October 4th, we're going to move to in-person worship on Sunday mornings, um, Sunday, October 4th. Now, there's going to be a few things that are going to be different about that regathering. First, we're going to meet outside, not inside. We're going to gather in our parking lot, similar to our Sunday evening communion services, if you've joined us for those. Also, we're going to meet at 9 a.m., not 10 a.m. We're going to move an hour earlier to take advantage of the cooler weather. So Sunday, October 4th, 9 a.m., in our parking lot, we're going to gather for in-person worship. Now, if you're not able to join us, we're going to stream the service through our YouTube channel so you can join us there live as we worship together. But personally, I'm excited to, to gather in person on the corner of Howard and 30th again as a, a church community on Sunday mornings. And as we continue our worship time, I want to read the first question from the the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, this has been a catechism that's been in the church for over 500 years that has brought uh, followers of Jesus comfort and encouragement during uh, mountain peak times and valley times. And so the question is, what is your only hope in life and death? And the answer is this, and I hope and pray it's our answer as well. So our only hope in life is death, is that I'm not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and he has set me free from all the power of the devil. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. I invite you now to receive our call to worship this morning. Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Please see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being with us as we prepare to worship. This morning, I just want to draw our attention to the first line of the song, which says, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. And in one sense, we're just stating something that is true. Uh, that this morning, however, you may find yourself uh, turning on your computer, uh, that our hearts are, are known. That God knows uh, what we bring to our couches, knows what we went to bed with last night, knows our hopes or desires for today. Uh, but in another sense, this line is an invitation. It's an invitation for us to, uh, to as much as uh, we have the ability to say, yes, God, I want to open myself to you. As we come this morning and worship. Uh, I want to be affected by who you are. Let's sing. Mighty God. To you all hearts are open Searching your thoughts and anxious fears Wash us in the fountain of your mercy Come with your light We cannot hide from you Mighty 
Hallelujah, you've come, and we sing hallelujah, hallelujah. you've come near to us, we sing hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, Your breath, your breath, and I 
carried in just the gift of today, God. But in the midst of everything that's going on, God, we think of the fires. Lord, in Oregon, we think of the fires in Monrovia. We think of the fires here in San Diego. We say, Lord, have mercy. God, as the firefighters are going into those places, surrounded with smoke, God, we pray that your spirit would be their strength, their sustenance, that you would fill their lungs with air that does not harm them. God, we pray for those who are caught in the midst are trapped or have been trapped, God, and just for your, your healing, your healing of trauma, your healing of bringing back and restoring things that have been destroyed. And we just hold, we hold them up, hold them up to you. I thank you for them and others God, of people who sign up with their lives to say, I want to serve the common good and therefore I put myself at risk. God, we thank you. So on behalf of these communities, on behalf of those going to war with this raging fire. <laughs> Let's just sing this in praise to God, thankful for the gifts that he gives us, the ability to, to breathe today. And it's your breath in our hearts, so we pour Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. storm or drought on the rock that does not move I will set my hope in your love oh Lord and your faithfulness will prove you are steadfast steadfast 
by the words you spoke all the starry hosts are called out by name each night in your watchful care i will rest suck your eyes you lead us with your light you are steadfast steadfast Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Philemon, verses 1 and 8 through 16. Paul a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy our brother, to Philemon our dear friend and fellow worker. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am ascending him, who is my very heart, 
back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in change for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So these summer months, we've been working through the book of Ephesians, and we come to our next section, Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. And I imagine the reading of this text is a bit jarring to our modern ears when we see things like masters and slaves, and we see words like obey and respect. Uh, They're difficult, challenging words, particularly in the cultural moment that we're living in right now, where We're having this conversation about racial injustice and reflecting on at least the history in our country and the 400 years of racial injustice, going back to slavery and then to Jim Crow and to segregation and disenfranchisement and the moment that we're living in right now. And I think as we hear those words, natural questions emerge like, "Can can I trust what was just read? And maybe for that matter, can I trust the Bible? And my hope in this sermon is that as we work through the kind of cultural context in which this passage was written into, and then we can step back a little bit and think about the biblical t- context around this idea of slaves and masters, and then finally bring that to bear on our present context, context and ask, how do we live now? My hope is that we will see that actually the, the call and the urge of, of the Bible is actually to elevate to elevate the marginalized because of the mercy that we have received from Christ. That it's to elevate, not push down, but to lift up those who are marginalized because of the mercy we, we, we have received, because we have been lifted up in Christ. And so this first idea of the cultural context, what was, what was happening in Ephesus? What, what is the nature of slavery at this time? What is Paul writing into because he says in verse five, slaves and earthly masters. Now it's worth saying and, and repeating throughout this series that, that the context of, of slavery during this time in ancient Rome and in the city of ancient Ephesus, it actually has no modern day equivalents. That we can't kind of take a one for one of what was slavery like in the first century and bring that to our, our understanding of what's happening in our world now or what we might naturally do is think about slavery in our country in, in the 19th century American slavery and the, the horror and the evil that that was. Because I think naturally that's what our ears will do. We'll see slaves and we'll see masters and we'll think about 19th century American slavery and the horror of, of Europeans going and kidnapping Africans from their their homes and bringing them to the Americas and then selling them into slavery as possessions owned by their masters with no rights. See, we, we see slaves and masters and we think of that type of slavery and we, we read that into this text and think that Paul is writing about that, maybe subconsciously. And it's just really helpful to say that that is not a one for one and that's not what Paul is writing about, kind of a, a race-based slavery with the white and black dynamics. See, Paul would know nothing of that idea and that's not what he's writing about. And it's helpful for us just to acknowledge that in this text to to not think of 19th century American slavery. Now go back to our text. So when Paul writes in verse 5, slaves, it is a fair way to translate that Greek word as slaves, but maybe a more accurate word or helpful word for us would be bondservant. Would be bondservant because when we hear bondservant, then it's actually something different than when we think of 19th century American slavery with, with no rights and kind of possession of a master. See, a bondservant would, would be in slavery for a set amount of time. And they actually could rise up the social kind of structure and gain status. There is actually quite a number of slaves who were part of the, the 1% of ancient Ephesus in the Roman Empire as they were attached to masters who were in that status. 
And so they were, they were in slavery for a set amount of time, and they could have possessions, and they could kind of raise up the social status layer. And they had a different types of jobs. You know, to be a bondservant was very uh, wide spectrum. You know, some were in manual labor. You know, others would manage the household of a wealthy individual. Some actually were advisors to the emperor. The emperor Claudius actually had key advisors who were slaves uh, who advised him on how to run state. And so it's, it's just very uh, varied in what uh, slaves did. It's estimated that in the ancient Ephesus, the city in which Paul was writing into in the surrounding region, one-third of the population were slaves or bond servants. And actually, in the ancient Roman Empire, there was estimated that there were 60,000 slaves or bond servants. And so, it's, it, it just was part of the culture and part of the time. Actually, W.L. Westerman, he's a leading historian on ancient slavery. This is what he wrote. He said, the institution of slavery was a fact of Mediterranean economic life, so completely accepted as part of the labor structure of the time that one can't correctly speak of the slave problem in antiquity. It was one-third of the, the population. It was 60 million people. And there was a variety of reasons in which someone could be brought into slavery or bond servanthood. You know, the Roman Empire was expanding at that time, and if you lost a war to them, you could be just forced into slavery. You know, ancient Israel at this time, at the time in which Jesus was alive, was a land that was conquered by Rome, and so those citizens could be brought into slavery by Rome. But you also could put yourself into slavery. Like if you lost your job and you took on a massive debt, you could, you could sell yourself into slavery for a set period of time to pay off that debt. Some really poor people actually would, would bring themselves into slavery to gain security and a shelter and food. Um, but the point, the point in all this is that slavery was very varied. There was a series of different types of jobs. And it wasn't race-based. It wasn't a white and black dynamic. And there is really no modern-day equivalent to it. So when we, when we hear these words from Paul, let's not think of 19th century American slavery and the horror around that. Um, it was just part of the economic structure. Now, with all of that said, I don't want you to hear me say, nor should we think that this was good. That any sense of enslaving someone or kind of being underneath someone in this sort of way, I think it does tarnish the image of God in the Imago Dei. And this, I don't think, is God's ultimate desire or ethic for this world. I think it is actually a picture of the broken, scarred world because of the fall and because of sin. That slaves could be exploited and they did have limited rights if you're familiar with the Oscar-winning uh, movie Gladiator, uh, that actually pictures ancient slavery and, and one vantage point of it pretty well. You have the Roman general who was betrayed and he was sold into slavery, Maximus, played by Russell Crowe, and you see the humiliation and exploitation that he experienced as a, as a Roman general sold into slavery. You see kind of the minimizing of the Imago Dei, the image of God in that person. So all that to say, there just there isn't a one-to-one -one equivalence. It looks very different, probably more like bond servitude than slavery. And it doesn't look like 19th century American slavery. But it still leaves questions, doesn't it? And this is kind of our second point of the biblical context. Okay, if it's not a one-to-one -to, -one to what we naturally think about with slavery, is the apostle Paul still pro-slavery in some form or fashion? Is the Bible pro-slavery in some form or fashion. And I think here is where we really need to kind of work hard to read the Bible um, accurately and correctly because I think what we can see is Paul planting these redemptive seeds that ultimately lead to the destruction of slavery. In the text that we have and in other letters that he wrote, they're seeds, they're not, they're not fully grown plants yet. Slavery isn't fully kind of destroyed but there's seeds, there's plants that move us towards this ultimate ethic. You know, as I'm speaking now, there'll be a graphic that will come up on the screen, and you're going to see an X, a Y, and a Z, and it's this way of reading the Bible that I think is so helpful for passages like this. 
So the X that you'll see is the current context or the context in which Paul is writing the letter into. It's how people would think. And so in ancient Ephesus, people couldn't imagine a world without slavery. It was just part of the normal way of doing life. And then Y is the um, isolated words that Paul writes. And so Paul writes these words into that context. And from the, the original context, those readers would see those words from Paul and they would see the redemptive nature of them. They would see how these words are countercultural. But you fast forward for us so many centuries later and we look back and we're like, these words feel regressive if you'd bring those into our current context. But then that's where the Z is helpful because actually you can see the trajectory that Paul is writing. So we have an original context where slavery is just accepted and understood and couldn't be imagined without. And you have Paul writing countercultural words that we'll talk about in a moment, ultimately leading to this ultimate ethic. I think uh, to an ultimate ethic where there is no slavery. And what empowered Christians throughout generations to work for the abolishment of the slave trade and the abolishment of slavery and to see the imago Dei in every person. New Testament scholar William Webb, this is what he writes about this this way of, of reading the Bible, this hermeneutic. He says, Scripture does not present a finalized ethic in every area of human relationship. Now, in some places it does, but when it comes to slavery, it doesn't. And Webb goes on and says, to stop where the Bible stops with its isolated words ultimately fails to reapply the redemptive spirit of the text as it spoke to the original audience. While Scripture had a positive influence in its time, we should take that redemptive spirit and move to an even better, more fully realized ethic today. So what he's saying is, see the redemptive spirit in which Paul is writing to his context And to use our praying imagination as we follow Jesus and to take that redemptive spirit into our time and to say, okay, how can we reapply that redemptive spirit in places where there is injustice, where the Imago Dei isn't isn't celebrated in our neighbor? To elevate the marginalized because of the mercy of Christ we receive. That's what he's saying. So where are these countercultural seeds that Paul is, is planting? So Imagine ourselves in ancient Ephesus in a world where masters have all the rights over slaves and a world couldn't be imagined without slavery. And Paul says in verse nine, masters in the same way. And what he's doing is he's putting masters and slaves or bond servants on the same playing field that you mutually submit to Christ and you treat each other the same way. This was radical and countercultural in its time because masters had all the rights. So he's saying there is no difference between master and slave and how you you treat each other. Or he goes on in verse nine and says, there is no favoritism with God. So what he's saying there is that when God sees people of different social standings, he doesn't prefer one to another because it would be natural for a person in, in ancient Rome to think of the gods and for them to value the person of the higher status with more freedom and more wealth and more security and more praise in the social setting for that person to be favored. And Paul is saying, no, there is no favoritism with God. Again, these redemptive seeds planted, showing that the image of God is equally in both people. And then he goes on, talks to the slaves, and he talks to them about, like, you're slaves of Christ. Obey Christ work with sincerity of heart, which again, this, this would be counterculture in this time because Paul is saying, don't fix your eyes on the person that you're under authority. Fix your eyes on Christ and serve Christ. These redemptive seeds. But then if we step out into the bigger biblical context and we think about the letter to Philemon, now this is a radical letter in his time. So what's going on in this letter is Philemon is this slave owner and he has this slave named Onesimus. And Onesimus runs away from Philemon for some reason and he finds himself coming to the Apostle Paul and Paul leads him to Christ. And in leading him to Christ, Paul does two interesting things. First, he sends him back to Philemon. So he sends him back to Philemon but he also sends him back with a letter. And the letter says many interesting things, but what is groundbreaking and so countercultural is Paul says to Philemon, 
receive back Onesimus no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. So what Paul is saying is that Onesimus is coming back to you, Philemon, and he was a slave before, but, but in Christ, because of the gospel of Jesus, receive him back not as a slave, but as someone who works for you. But even more than that, receive him back as a brother in Christ. Again, this redemptive seed that was planted that when grown brought down slavery in the ancient Roman Empire. F.F. Bruce, a leading New Testament thinker, writes this about Paul's letter to Philemon. He says, while this letter, what this letter does is to bring us into an atmosphere which the institution of slavery could only wilt and die. See, it's this redemptive seed, it's this gospel motivation that ended slavery in the Roman Empire, not in spite of Ephesians 6 and passages like that in Philemon, but because of them. But because followers of Jesus like Philemon had, had no right and no reason to keep slaves, but they are on the same level. There's no favoritism that this person is a brother in Christ, not a possession. And it's leading ultimately to this ultimate ethic that Paul captures in the letter to Galatians in Galatians 3, 28, that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. See, that is the ultimate ethic where the Bible is heading. That's what the new heavens and the new earth will look like. And this side of that new heavens and the new earth, we try to live and to pray and to work and to build communities towards that end. And sometimes it takes time. And Paul working in a, in a period in which slavery would be, to, the ab- abolition of slavery would be unimaginable, he's planting these seeds which get embedded in the church and it goes down roots. And when, when followers of Jesus take these things seriously, like the words of Philemon, there is no slavery. See, if we say that the Bible is pro-slavery, then we're just misunderstanding the intent of the Bible. The Bible is pro-freedom leading to this ultimate ethic. And it's why Christians throughout time have embraced this ultimate ethic and led like William Wilberforce in England for the abolition of the slave trade or the late uh, member of the House of Representatives, John Lewis, a follower of Jesus, civil rights leader, freedom writer, led the march on this bloody Sunday in Alabama over the bridge. It was his faith in a loving God and a belief in this ultimate ethic that led him to march and to fight for the rights of African Americans in this country. And it was this motivation because of this, of following Jesus and this ethic. This is John Lewis's own words. He says, during those early years, we didn't study the Constitution or the Supreme Court decision of 1954. We would ask questions about what would Jesus do? In preparing for the sit-ins, we felt that the message was one of love. The message of love in action. Don't hate. If someone hits you, don't strike back. Just turn the other side. Be prepared to forgive. That's not anything any constitution say about forgiveness. It is straight from the scripture. It's reconciliation. See, when we take that biblical perspective in mind and we see that there is this ultimate ethic in view, that's what motivates followers of Jesus to bring this redemptive spirit into their time and to reapply it. And so what about us as we've, we've thought about the cultural context of Ephesus, which is so important to realize that we don't have this one-for-one one equivalent in, in our time or in other parts of history with this slavery. And we see this biblical context where actually God's vision for his people is Galatians 3.28, this even playing field, this amago day. How do we reapply that in our time when we realize that ultimate ethic is lacking? What, what do we do? Well, I want us to think about this acronym of ARC, of ARC, of awareness and remorse or lament and then commitment. Because when we live in our time and we're thinking about the context of, of slavery in our history and the ramifications that that had and the racial injustice conversations that we're having in our country, um, 
for, for some, our country is a place of hope. For others, it was a place that shattered hope. For some, it was a city on the hill. For others, it was a darkness in a valley. And it's important for us, if we're going to reapply this redemptive spirit of neither slave nor free, and we have our eyes fixed on living for the new heavens and the new earth, reapplying this redemptive spirit, I think, is this we can do it through this acronym of ARC, of awareness and remorse or lament or commitment. And this first idea is awareness. See, I think to, to know how to reply, apply this spirit, we need to be just aware if we're not. So a few suggestions. There's a book called The Color of Compromise written by Jamar Tisby. And this coming Tuesday night, there's going to be a book a book club starting at Covenant over Zoom Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. for five weeks to read this, this book together and ask questions about it, to build awareness together as a community. Jamar Tisby is a, a follower of Jesus who has written this historical survey of the, the church in America and the places in where the church has given in to, to racism, to, to not live towards this ultimate ethic. It's a really helpful book to build awareness, invites you to, to join this book club. You can reach out to the church, you can reach out to Pat Little directly, who's gonna host this group. A great place to build awareness. Another suggestion, just Google New York Times and Esau McCauley. You spell his last name M-C-C-A-L-L-Y. Esau McCauley is a professor at Wheaton College and a, an Anglican pastor, and he's just written powerful commentary on what's happening in our time as a, a black man and a Christian living in our time. Encourage you to read his and just build awareness on what he is writing. Another book suggestion, John Perkins, who's been a leader like John Lewis during the uh, movement for, for uh, African American rights, has written a book that probably will be his, his last book as he's later in years. It's a book called One Blood, Parting Words to the Church on Race and Love. Again, just encouraging you to read these resources and build awareness. Maybe if you have kids at home, here's another book written by Trilla Newble called God's Very Good Idea. We've written it to, read it to our boys and just a, a really beautiful picture of what God's ultimate ethic is like and helping to disciple them at their young age. But I think to, to reapply this redemptive spirit in our time to take seriously God's ultimate ethic is to be aware. And probably for some of us, our awareness is just our lived experience and the injustice and the pain that we have felt. For others, we, we haven't felt that, but we need to lean into the experiences of our brothers and sisters in Christ and to, to build awareness. But whether it's our lived experience or it's, it's reading and, and praying through others' lived experience, the next movement of that arc I think is remorse or lament. You know, I, I recently finished the book of Color of Compromise. You can't help but read that book and not feel a deep sadness and a pain and a remorse and a lament for the ways in which the church has failed. It doesn't mean the church is a failure. It doesn't mean Jesus is a failure, but there are, there are many places in the history of the American church where we have failed. And you have a choice with that. What do you, what do, you do with that pain? Or as, as you lay, lean into this as an individual and you have your own lived experiences of pain and suffering, desiring that ultimate ethic, but realizing your lived experience isn't that, what do you do with that? And I think that's where lament is so helpful. You bring that to God. And, and the Bible gives us such permission to do that. I mean, you read through the Psalms and there's Psalms of pain there and hurt and anger and God, where are you? So we bring all that pain and we bring all that frustration and we bring it to the throne of God and we leave it there. And we don't hide and we don't sugarcoat things. We express our pain, we express our remorse, we express our lament and we ask boldly at the throne of God. We dare to pray that things would be different. We can look back at the history of the church and we can see where there's lament, but we also can look back and see where this redemptive spirit has carried followers of Jesus of Christ to work towards this ultimate ethic. And we can find hope in that and we can boldly pray that it would happen again 
and again and again. And I think the reason that we do that, that we bring these to God and we pray boldly is because there is the place again to hope. To hope that one day things will be different and that we know where things are heading because if we don't bring it to God and we don't kind of bring all of our emotions and our remorse and our lament and our pain and our lived experience to God, it's gonna diminish hope and shrink hope. But bringing it to God, I think, is the pathway to hope. So it's arc, it's awareness, it's, it's praying to God, it's remorse, it's lament, but then it needs to be commitment to reapplying this redemptive spirit in our time. Here's words from Jamar Tisby from that book, The Color of Compromise. He says, progress is possible, but we must learn to discern the difference between complicit Christianity and courageous Christianity. Complicit Christianity forfeits its moral authority by devaluing the image of God and people of color. Like a ship that has a cracked hull and is taking on water, Christianity has run aground on the rocks of racism and threatens to capsize. It has lost its integrity. But by contrast, courageous Christianity embraces racial and ethnic diversity. It stands against any person, policy, or practice that would dim the glory of God reflected in the life of human beings from every tribe and tongue. These words are a call to abandon complicit Christianity and move toward courageous Christianity. So the question is, how can we be courageous? Motivated by the mercy of, motivated by the mercy of God in our lives, how can we elevate someone who might be marginalized? How can we be courageous? And maybe for some of us, the first step is making ourselves uncomfortable in being aware. But hopefully we move through that and we commit ourselves and we lean into some place in which we don't see that ultimate ethic at work. And because of the mercy of God in our lives, we lean and we commit into that area. Maybe it's in schools. Maybe God has given you a heart for schools and for urban schools and schools where there might not be as many resources. And the education might not be as good and you, you lean into that. You lean into places where kids are marginalized. That's why we talk about San Diego refugee tutoring a lot. It's a place where you can come alongside refugee students who might not have as many opportunities and to lift them up. Maybe it's prison reform. You know, if you read anything and become aware of prison reform, it disproportionately people of color are incarcerated there. Maybe that's a place where you want to lean into and build awareness and see the ultimate ethic of God at work. Maybe it's using resources God has given you to scholarship a student who might not have an opportunity to go to school. It might be providing a work opportunity to someone who might not have that opportunity. Maybe it, for you, it is just getting together with a friend and having a political conversation that is difficult and hard for the sake of the church and its goodness. Maybe it's gathering a trusted brother and sister in Christ and just confessing some prejudices in your heart that you need to work through and you need help. I, like, there are so many places that we can commit and lean to if we're building awareness. We can see the places where that ultimate ethic isn't at play and we can lean into it for the sake of Jesus. But I think it's that, that arc movement. And, it, and I don't think it's just a one-time deal. I think we're continually making ourselves aware and we're continually bringing that awareness to the throne of God and praying and lamenting and feeling remorse and pain. And then it's committing where we are able and leaning into that. It's elevating the marginalized because of the mercy of Christ we have experienced. You know, many years ago in the 1850s, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, she wrote a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was really important for brothers and sisters in Christ who were white and black then, and I think the words are still powerful today. You know, like Tom, at the end of a grueling day in the book, he was wondering if the word of God had lost its power, and I think for us, we can wonder that as well as we enter into some of these conversations. And the slave master in this book, Simon Legree, mocks Tom and says, well, old boy, you find your religion don't work, it seems. Hear Harriet Beecher Stowe's words as she describes Tom's despair, but also his hope. Words that I think capture our moment, but hopefully our hope as well. She says the 
The atheistic taunts of his cruel master sank his already dejected soul to the lowest ebb. And though the hand of faith still held to the eternal rock, it was a numb, despairing grasp. Tom sat like one stunned. But then suddenly everything around him seemed to fade, and a vision rose before him of one crowned with thorns, buffeted and bleeding. And Tom gazed in awe and wonder at the majestic patience of the face. The deep, pathetic eyes thrilled him to his inmost heart. His soul awoke as with floods of emotion. He stretched out his hands and fell on his knees. When gradually the vision changed and the sharp thorns became rays of glory and in splendor inconceivable, he saw that face bending compassionately towards him. See, the, the master that we follow left the glory of heaven and he became a slave for us to lift us up. He traded the glory of heaven for the, the grave of sin so that we could be free from the bondages of our own sin and the brokenness of this world and the ways in which it's not supposed to be. And we hope for that new heavens and new earth to come where one day there will be no racism or segregation or exploitation and everyone who's made in the image of God will be created with dignity and respect and treated that way. See, we reflect on the mercy of Christ we have received, captured in Harriet Beecher Stowe's words, so that we'll have the motivation to elevate the marginalized that we see in our lives. And until that day comes, the new heavens and new earth, we pray and we live these words. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this, this call, this urge, this motivation. Because of the mercy we have see, received and the, the bondage that has been broken in our lives, Lord, would you use it to spur us on, to give dignity and honor and respect to all people who are made in your image. That we might seek to live out this ultimate ethic that you call us to, this redemptive spirit because of the mercy we have received, because we have been set free from sin. Lord, would you, would you make us aware? Would you make us quick to pray to you? And would you make us quick to commit to this work you've called us to? We pray all this in the strong name of Christ. Amen. God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself let us be known let us be known by the way we love let us be known let us be known by the way we love. Love the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. I will split apart here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Love your neighbor as the way we love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Love your neighbor as the way we love. Switch it up. Let us be your heart and soul and mind. And love your neighbor as the way we love. Let us be known, let us be known, by the way we love, 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 the greatest commandment is love, 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 the greatest commandment is love, love, 
So receive now the Lord's benediction from number six. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So go now in your day in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.